five plan is that uh, they kind of project it only takes about five minutes a day to read the reading for the day. So um, unless you're a slow reader like me, it might take twice as long, but that's okay. Where no one's going to track you. And so for the first week, we got Mark chapters one through five. And another thing I like about this Bible plan is that it mixes it up. It doesn't go straight through the all the Gospels, you know, back to back. It kind of breaks them up so that you're, you know, you get refreshed on the Gospel message as you go throughout the the year. So it's really good. And if you have a smartphone, you can get the Bible app if you don't have that already, either on Android or Apple. And they have the five by five by five plan inside of it. So I like that because I like to have uh, electronically tracked, you know, so I can keep, it helps keep me on pace a little bit better. So um, if you're a smartphone person, look into that. All right, well, we wanted to pray for somebody in our church fellowship today and the Lord chose Laura Kramer. So we'll pray for Laura. Father, uh, we thank you so much for our sister, God, thank you for just the awesome things that you have done in her life, Lord. I thank you for bringing her here to Grant County and, and her family, Lord. Uh, we're so grateful to, to have gotten to know her over the last couple of years. And Lord, we're just praying for your breast, uh, blessings to fall upon Laura, Lord, that um, you would truly just enrich her walk with you, God, and that you would use her to bless others. And so we thank you for her in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, you guys can go ahead and make your way to Hebrews 8. You're there. So at the start of today's chapter, the writer is going to wrap up the thoughts that he uh, finished chapter 7 on. So remember, in the original writings of both the Old Testament and New Testament, there were no chapter verse, none of that was there in the original writings, right? They would just write straight through. And so this would have been essentially connected to the, the end of the thoughts of chapter seven. Now, often the, the Bible translators, I think, did a pretty good job at breaking up chapters, but sometimes, you know, it's a little awkward when they break in certain places. So, uh, which is fine, you know, we, it's, it's kind of a good recap for us to review what we learned last week anyways. And so I want to recap three verses that we looked at last Sunday, okay? And they're Hebrews 7, 26 through 28. I know I told you to turn to chapter 8, didn't I? So we, I've gotten here for you if you can't flip back, but let's go ahead and read those. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. So that's that's the basis of what he's going to continue on here in ver, or, uh, chapter 8. Now, one thing that these verses teach us is that Jesus is the perfected version of the high priest, especially when we consider him to an earthly high priest, right? And obviously, we're not familiar with what a high priest does in these times, but when we read through the Old Testament, we get a pretty good idea of what the job of the high priest was. And so Jesus was the perfected version of the high priest. Now, because there was the perfect version of the high priest, that is Jesus Christ, there was something better that had to be instituted. Okay, and that's a big theme of what we're going to look at today, that there was something better to be instituted. Now, Jesus ascended into heaven approximately only 37 short years, um, excuse me, after he ascended into heaven, approximately 37 short years is when the fall of Jerusalem took place. And so many of his contemporaries 
would have been there for his ministry, his birth ministry, and then they would have also seen the fall of Jerusalem. And most Bible scholars believe that the book of Hebrews was written just before the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple that came along with that conquest. And so later on, we're going to look at a verse that I think helps give us a good clue that that is the case. But the, the important thing to understand here is that the writer is not making claim that Jesus is better because Jerusalem fell. And what I mean by that is Jesus wasn't a second best option. You know, the Jews, were, the Jews were so immersed in Judaism, right? And that was their world. That was their worship. And so when that crumbled, it's not like they went, well, there's this Jesus guy. You know, why don't we go follow him? It was different than that, right? Jesus brought in the new covenant while the system was still in place. And that's important for us to realize because Jesus is the greater realization of the covenant and the high priest. And so he's not a second thought. He's not the second best. He's the primary best. Now the new covenant was not put in place because the old failed. It was not put in place because the nation of Israel felt. It was put in place because God brought down the new covenant. The realization of the new covenant was brought by Jesus Christ down to earth. And that's what God intended for mankind all along. Now, I titled today's message, Behold, He Makes All Things New. And I titled I titled it that because that's what Jesus does, right? He brings the new covenant. He brings the new priesthood. And then he brings newness of life into us, right? That's why our salvation experience is called being born again, because Jesus makes things brand new. And so Jesus instituted the new infallible priesthood in which only he himself serves, and so that's the backdrop for the context of what we're going to look at in chapter 8 today. And so if you're not already there, go ahead and look at verse 1 with me. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. 1 through 6. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Verse three, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. Five, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Verse six, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Now, this is the main point of what we are saying, right? That's how he starts this. This is the main point of what we're saying. We have a high priest who is alive and actively serving at the right hand of the Father's throne. And the description of Jesus as high priest is in the present tense. And this is a game changer. You know, if you've never come to the realization of this, you know, I, I know that most of you believe in Jesus and that he rose from the dead and that he's alive in heaven. I think uh, most Christians would agree with that. But after he rose from the dead and he went to his father's throne and sat there in honor, that wasn't the end of the story, right? Jesus is actively ministering on our behalf from the throne right now this present day. It's an active role, and that's what 
the writer is saying here is that he is still serving as high priest. Now we have to clarify a couple things when we say that because that doesn't mean that Jesus is making sacrifices like the earthly high priests had to do, right? Remember, he's the better version of the high priest because the high priest in Judaism had to go into the tabernacle or the temple, the most holy place, once a year. And he was to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, but that only occurred once a year. And so it's not like Jesus is in heaven doing that once a year because he did it once and for all, right? Look again at verse 27. I think I still have it up there, right? Yeah. Verse 27. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. And so it's an eternal sacrifice. It's perfect. And so even though he's fulfilling that heavenly role as our high priest, He's not still making sacrifices, okay? So it's imper important to understand that because his sacrifice was perfect. And because it was perfect, it's eternal. Now, in Hebrews chapters 9 and 10, which we will get to in the next couple weeks, uh, the writer goes into this a little more in depth, but I just want to highlight a couple of verses uh, that I found in those chapters that kind of help explain uh, what he's talking about here. Okay, so the first is Hebrews 10.1, and the other is Hebrews 10.4, so they're right close together. So I'll read verse 1 first. For the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. And then down in verse four, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. So the old system, the old covenant, failed at making people perfect. Now, I think that's uh, rather obvious to most of us, especially us as Christians now, because they had to do it on a regular basis, right? They were constantly making sin offerings, uh, burnt offerings, gift offerings, wave offerings, drink offerings, right? They had all their offerings that they had to make on a regular basis. And then the national repentance, uh, where the high priest would take in the blood of an animal, um, to the Holy of Holies. And so the Old Covenant failed in doing the job in making people perfect. Now, that's a really profound thing, you know, because you and I in our state as believers are perfect in Jesus Christ. And that's definitely something we have to take by faith, right? I know I'm challenged with that all the time because I am not perfect. I do not feel perfect. But remember, Jesus Christ's sacrifice is permanent and perfect for all time, for all eternity. And so when I stand before my father, he doesn't see my sin, right? He sees the atoning work of Jesus Christ forever. And that's something that we have to come to that truth as believers, Right, because the, our enemy wants to condemn us. You know, man, you really blew it this week. You tripped up again. How many times are you going to commit this sin? And we fall into condemnation. But we have to remember that Jesus' blood is perfect in forgiving our sins. Yes, we have to repent. Yes, we have to come clean with our Father. But we don't have to worry about that sin not being covered by the blood of Jesus. The sin's paid for. And if I sin again, it's paid for. If I blow it again, it's paid for. It's already paid for. So we can think of Jesus' sacrifice as a perpetual one. It's one that's ongoing. It's one that's alive and active today, tomorrow, and forever. Now, a lot of this comes... Uh, from the perspective of God, right? God is eternal. Time does not exist to God, right? He, he lives outside of our time domain. And so he sees the past. 
He's in the past. He sees the present. He's in the present. He's in the future. He sees the future. All simultaneously. And so his sacrifice that surely he made approximately 2,000 years ago is as just as fresh today as it was back then. And so there's a lot of hope for us in that. We don't have to worry about the atoning work of Jesus Christ running out or that we miss the boat or anything like that. Now, what Jesus is actively doing, this is the second part of that truth, is that he's interceding on our behalf. And I don't know exactly what that means or what that looks like, but all I know is that we get the sense that he's working on our behalf, right? He's pleading the Father for you and I, for the sinners to come home, for the sinners to repent. He's actively doing that. And that's really awesome because that's the living and active nature of our God. He's interceding for, for mankind. Now, the, the whole purpose of the high priest was to represent sinners, right? Sinners were not allowed to go into uh, the, the inner sanctuary nor the Holy of Holies. And so the high priest was their representative. And so uh, Jesus is still our mediator. He's still our representative who takes our cases before the Father. Gavin, can you put up Hebrews 7.25? My app crashed again. There we go. This was the verse before the ones that I just uh, shared with you earlier. Um, it says, therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He always lives to make intercession for them. This truth is repeated in Romans 8.38. Gavin, if you could put that up for me. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. And so this is woven throughout, Christ, uh, throughout the scriptures, right? Jesus making intercession for you and I. And that's why in verse two, the writer calls Jesus a minister, right? Because he's literally ministering on our behalf actively from heaven. Now, Jesus didn't serve in the tab tabernacle or the temple, right? He's, again, he's the perfect version of the high priest. He didn't physically go into those places. And why not? Because those were a shadow of the true tabernacle, right? We're told that they're, they're merely copies. I like to think of them um, as kind of like an artist's rendition. You know, Moses was given a vision of the, the true tabernacle, the true inner holy place of God. And then he was to model the earthly tent, the tabernacle, after that. And when you read Revelation, you know that the throne room of God is amazing compared to what they had as, you know, some animal skins covering boards, right? It's the, the true picture. And so all these things are just pictures of what was to come. They were all foreshadowing Jesus Christ. And so Jesus didn't go into those places uh, to, to um, give offerings for those. Instead, he did it on the cross. But he is actively in heaven ministering for us. And so we can think of this as Jesus being the superior fulfillment of all these things, right? He completed them in his perfect sacrifice. Now, another role of the high priest, and the, the writer gets into it here in Hebrews, was that they were to also bring up free will offerings or gifts before the throne. And if you notice there in our Hebrews passage, he says that it was necessary for the high priest to do that. So we already talked about how perfect the Lord's sacrifice was, right? It was perfect, it's eternal, but what gift did he bring? What was the gift that he brings up as an offering on our behalf? Well, it's grace. 
The word grace actually means gift. And that's what Jesus Christ brings for you and I. That's what he offers up to God, is the grace of God. And that is perfectly expressed through Jesus Christ. Gavin, if you could put up Ephesians 2, 8. You guys are familiar with this verse. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. And so our salvation is a gift. And the reason why it's a gift is because none of us have done anything to deserve it or earn it. You know, we don't have an attaboy sticker that gets us into heaven, right? It's because of God's mercy and God's grace. But Jesus died on the cross for you and I, and that's the only reason. And so it's a gift. It's free. We can't do anything to earn it. We just have to have faith. Remember, we saw that verse in, uh, in Hebrews 10, 4, the blood of rams and goats are not sufficient to take away sin. But the lamb or the blood of the lamb of Jesus Christ is sufficient to take it away. Now, you might have the question or maybe it comes to mind, you know, why did God institute the old covenant then? If blood was not sufficient to take away the sins of mankind, why did he even allow it to exist in the first place? Well, I kind of hit on this. It was either last Sunday or the Sunday before, but the um, God did that because he had to show mankind that there, that Jesus Christ was the only way, right? That blood of animals was not sufficient to take away our sins. That is, we can't continually slaughter animals to be washed and made right with God. I like the way that uh, David Guzik puts it because he talked about in his um, commentary, he said that you can think of it as steps, steps to God's perfect plan. Because think about all the, all the covenants he made, all the promises he made to people throughout history. We can go all the way back to Genesis. What was the promise that was given to Adam and Eve? The offspring of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Right, That there would come somebody from the loins of Eve, that, or from the womb of Eve, that would put an end to the serpent. And then there was the promise to Noah, or the covenant with Noah, right? I will save the righteous, and I will not, and then he made the promise to Noah that he would not judge the earth with the flood again. Then we've got the Mosaic covenant, or excuse me, before that, Abraham, the covenant with Abraham, right? That he would make the offspring of Abraham a great nation. They would be greater than the sand on the seashore, and all the nations would be blessed by them. And that, of course, we know is the nation of Israel. Then there was the Mosaic Covenant, where the law, the Ten Commandments, the sacrificial system came into place. Again, that was just another step in God's plan uh, for mankind. Then there was the Davidic Covenant, right? He made a promise to David that David's throne would last for eternity and that the Messiah would sit on that throne forever. And so the final promise that we have is the new covenant. And that's what we're going to get into in the next section. And that's the covenant that Jesus brought down. So let's go ahead and jump into that. Verse 7 through 13. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with him, or with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 9, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law, 
my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now we, we hit on this last week, you know, or something very similar to it. And we, earned, we learned that the old law had to be annulled for the new priest to serve office. And this was hinting at the new covenant that was to come. That he's going, that he's talking about today here in chapter eight. But the old covenant was made better because Jesus instituted it. Now, if the Old Testament, or excuse me, the old covenant was sufficient, he says there in verse or in verse seven, then there would not have needed to be a second. If the first covenant was sufficient then we didn't need the new covenant. But it wasn't, clearly. Now, his, Israel had a history of failing in the old covenant, right? They failed time after time. They were not faithful to God. They served idols. Uh, there was rampant personal sin as well as national sin. And that's one thing we have to remember about Israel as well is that often what we see in the scriptures is from the, the point of view of the national Israel, right? There was always a faithful remnant in, in Israel. We had, we're actually told that in the scriptures, right? There's always a remnant of those who are faithful to God. The problem was as a whole, as a nation, they failed. They were very disobedient. Now, finally, we have the eternal covenant that's spoken of in Hebrews 13, 20. Gavin, can you put up Hebrews 13, 20 for us? Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. And so that's the covenant that Jesus brought down, an everlasting covenant. Now, his blood was perfect to forgive all of our sins. And what this means is that there is not going to be another covenant. If there was, if God planned to institute another covenant, then the blood of Jesus would not be declared to be perfect or the new covenant would not be declared to be perfect, right? It makes sense. And so we can rely that or rely on that. We can trust that the new covenant is a permanent eternal covenant for all mankind. Now, this doesn't mean that God's plan has fully been uh, realized, right? There's still a lot of prophecies that have to happen. You know, things like the return of Jesus, the millennial reign, the recreation of the heavens and the earth. There's a lot of big things that have to happen. The rapture, you know, a lot of really big things that have to happen. But there's not going to be a new covenant installed. And that's really the backbone of, of our hope, right? Because what this means is that we don't have to worry that we get to heaven and then 10,000 years down the road, all of a sudden the atoning work of Jesus runs out. Can you imagine what that would be like to be in heaven that long and then all of a sudden God said, well, sorry, you know, the blood ran out. That would be just as bad as the old covenant because that's what they were faced with. You know, they would go make their sacrifices and it would run out. They would have to do it again and again and again. But we're guaranteed that the blood of Jesus will last for eternity. And so that is where our hope lies. We don't have to worry about it running out. And that is the new covenant. It's here to stay. It's permanent. We don't have to worry about that being replaced by anything else or anything inferior. 
All right, now in verse 8, we're told that the Lord found fault with Israel for not keeping the covenant. The Lord found fault with them. Again, this is speaking nationally, right? The nation as a whole, they were rejecting God. And a couple things happened to them because of that, right? You guys know when you read through the Old Testament that they were taken away in captivity for quite a long time. You know, they were taken away to Babylon as prisoners, as slaves, just like what they came out of Egypt. And you think about what God's people, as far as the Jews, have gone through because of their disobedience. Slavery, captivity. Look at how they've been dispersed around the world the last 1900 years until 1948. That was actually the longest stint that they were, um, you know, being out of the land. So it's really incredible, you know, that um, how disobedient they've been and how God has still been so merciful to them. And we talked about this last week, but God is so merciful to them because he's still going to work through the nation of Israel. He's not done with them. And the resurrection of the nation of Israel is a good sign to that, right? 1948, all of a sudden they, they became a nation again. Just like the prophet Isaiah said that the dry, the dry bones, the dead bones were going to come back together again. And so we live in really exciting times, you know, because, um, you know, the end is near when it, when it talks about the last generation seeing the nation of Israel come back together again. And so we live in very prophetic, exciting times. But what we looked at in these verses here is that God is not done with the nation of Israel. And that's what we read through verses 9 through 12 here. And I shared a lot of these verses with you last week. And they're actually from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Okay, those are prophecies given by Jeremiah speaking of the nation of Israel going into disobedience, but then um, going into the new covenant. And look at the things that he said there. You know, I will be their God. They will be my people. I will write my laws on their hearts and on their minds. God is not done with them. And the fascinating thing is, look at verse 12. Let's read that again. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. What does that remind you of? In context, that's speaking of the nation of Israel, right? But that is the new covenant. That's us. That's you and I. You know, God is merciful to us. We were in disobedience. We were in sin. But the Lord said, because you have faith in my son, I will not remember your sin anymore. And so that's the same covenant that Israel is going to live under in the near future. At least I believe it's the near future. Lord's coming back. He's going to restore the nation of Israel under his leadership, under his throne. And so they were always intended to live under the new covenant. Again, that just shows us that the steps of God, they're all according to his perfect plan throughout history. All right, now in this last verse, the writer says this. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now the interesting thing about this sentence is that it has the term is ready. The old covenant was ready to pass away. And that's because Jerusalem was about to fall. The temple was about to be burned to the ground. And the whole system of Judaism was about to fall apart. Now, did the writer know that that was going to happen? I don't believe so. I, I don't believe that he was given a prophetic word that that was about to happen so that he wrote this. I believe that he's 
he's a doer and studier of the word, and he knows the prof the prophecy that's about to unfold. Right? He knows that Jesus brought the new covenant already. The new covenant was already installed at this point. And so it was just a matter of time before the old system crumbled. Right? Because once the new system is active, the new covenant, I shouldn't say system, it's a little nerdy, but um, once the new covenant is in place, there's no need for the old covenant. At that point, it just becomes a religious ritual. Right? And so a short 37 years later, it was done away with permanently. It's never been restored. The old system was already dead far before the new covenant was ever put in place. And that's because, nationally speaking, the Jews were not doing it by faith. Right? It was a religion to them. You guys have probably been taught or heard that the, the, the Jews added so many hundreds of laws on top of the laws of Moses, right? Stuff that isn't even recorded in our Bible. They've added law after law after law after law for the Jews to keep the system, right? To keep the religion of it going. But none of that was by faith. It was all done for religious purposes. And so God was very displeased with them, right? Because they did not live by faith. They were worshiping idols. And so it just got worse and worse and worse. So what can we, or what can be said about the new covenant that we get the pleasure of living under? I, I like to call it the age of grace. I've heard it called that before. I like that, you know, because we're all living under God's grace. You know, for some of us, the age of grace is all that we've known, right? Clearly, none of, none of us were uh, raised in the um, Jewish system or even the, the Old Covenant, obviously. But maybe you've always known God. Maybe you grew up in a Christian household and you were raised on Christian principles since you could walk, talk, and it's always been there. You've always had that faith. You've always had that belief. Or you might be somebody who um, came from a religious system. You know, maybe you grew up in a religion, but you didn't really know God. You didn't really know Jesus, right? That is what you were raised in. That's what you knew. And then maybe if you're like me, you know, you were taught about God young, but you didn't have a relationship with him until you got into adulthood. And then you had a born again experience and you became uh, a Christian at that point with true faith. Or maybe you're somebody who, you know, never knew anything about God, never uh, had any religious experience, never heard scripture spoken, anything like that. You just live for yourself or live for the flesh. But regardless of what our background is, regardless of uh, where we come from, anything apart from Jesus Christ is dead works. Even if it looks holy, even if it looks religious, if it's apart from faith, it's dead works. But the good news is, the new covenant that Jesus brought for mankind is for all sinners alike. Remember that verse? He can save to the uttermost. Jesus can take the worst of sinners, murderers, rapists. It doesn't matter. He can save them. Or he can take the religious prideful person who thinks that they're really holy, but they're not because they don't have Christ. He can work in those people as well. Gavin, if you put up the 2 Corinthians 5, 17 verse. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. 
And so the old things need to die, regardless of what our background is, regardless of what we grew up knowing about God or knowing, knowing about Jesus. Anything that's unprofitable or apart from faith needs to die. Just like the old covenant that was replaced by the new covenant, our old beliefs, our old behaviors need to die. What about old thinking patterns? Have any of you guys ever start, struggled with old thinking patterns? I know for me, you know, growing up, not living as a Christian, I had a lot of bad thinking patterns. And I still wrestle with them today. You know, I have to say, ah, get out of here. What about disobedience? Unbelief. What is keeping you from truly experiencing the joy of Jesus Christ? And I hope your answer is nothing, Pastor. You know, I'm right in the center of God's will. I'm experiencing the abundant life of Christ. I hope that's the case. But I realize, too, that we all get caught up in distractions, right? We get sidelined with worry, anxiety, fear, sin. And so those things need to die. Those distractions need to be put to rest because those are going to keep us from experiencing the Lord's joy. Remember, he makes all things new, right? It's us that drag the baggage around, right? We want to resurrect the old man, jump on the ground, you know, give him, give him life support. Come on, buddy, we can do this. But that's not what the Lord would have us do, right? The Lord wants to make it new. So today is a good day to do that, if any. Amen? Yes. All right, if you guys would stand with me, we will close in a word of prayer and sing our last song for the day. Lord Jesus, we do thank you so much that you make everything new. We thank you and praise you, God, for the new covenant that you bring.